Hi. According to Matthew 5, 44 through 48, Yahweh treats all people the same. He makes the sunshine and rain fall on both the just and the unjust. This passage states that loving only those who love us is no good. Anybody, even tax collectors, can do that. So Yahweh loves everybody, even his enemies, and blesses or curses us all alike. I know Christians would be quick to tell us that this is only in the here and now. It has nothing to do with the afterlife. If it did, Yahweh would treat the unjust in the afterlife the same as he does the just. It would mean universal salvation, and most Christians won't accept that. To their way of thinking, Yahweh changes and becomes like tax collectors before the judgment day. So this passage is saying only that there's no difference in the earthly lives of those who follow Jesus and those who don't. And of course, we can look around and know that those who follow the biblical gods are no better off than anyone else. Christians' lives are no better than ours. They're not happier, they're not wealthier, they're not smarter, and they're not healthier. We can see no difference between their lives and the lives of even the most evil among us. Yes, without a doubt, that's the way it is. But I have a question about this. Should it be this way? Should those who hate Yahweh receive his blessings the same as those who love him? Well, let's not worry about that question. Let's deal with this instead. Is that what Yahweh promised? That we'd all be treated the same in this life? Yes, he says it in the passage above, but is it what he said would happen? We certainly don't see that in the Old Testament. Here's what uh, Yahweh said to the Hebrews. This is Deuteronomy 11, 22 through 28. For if, you, if, she, <laughs> for if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you, then will the Lord drive out all those nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. There shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon. As he hath said unto you, Behold, I set before you to this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. So we see that if the Hebrews were obedient to Yahweh, they would receive lots of property, even property belonging to others in every piece of land they set foot on. They would be treated differently by Yahweh depending on whether they treated Yahweh differently. They would be top dog. They would be special chosen people, if you will, who were, Yahweh declared, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Their enemies, those who didn't follow Yahweh, would fear them. Well, in fact, they wouldn't have any enemies. Proverbs sixteen seven says, When a man's ways please Yahweh, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And listen to this from Isaiah 54, 6 through 17. Yahweh says Israel is his wife, and that the mountains may depart, and the hills be removed, but my loving kindness shall not depart from you. He says no terror would come upon Israel. And now listen to this from verse 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of Yahweh. Oh, Really? Now, the New Testament says that all who want to live godly in Jesus will suffer persecution, meaning Yahweh will not make the man whose ways please him be at peace with his enemies, but instead he'll be the recipient of major bullying and maltreatment. And yes, the followers of Yahweh may get their heads blown off or the brains splattered on the highway. It happens. And Christians certainly believe that they are persecuted. In fact, I just read the following from a minister named Louis Farrakhan, or Farrakhan, I'm not sure. He said, there is no one who really follows Jesus who does not pay a price. Who, who does not have a price to pay. You are going to be evil spoken of. You are going to be lied on. You may be brought into court falsely. You may be sent to prison falsely. You may even be put to death for following Jesus. Yes, the Bible corroborates this. Revelation 2.10, don't be afraid of the things which you're about to, you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison. For crying out loud, Jesus said he came to set a man at variance against his father and a woman against her mother. He said a man's enemies would be those in his own household. 
Yes, the Bible is contradictory, as I've said many times, regarding pretty much every single thing it says. But we're not considering biblical contradictions at the moment. If we considered all the biblical contradictions, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Let's continue with these promises Yahweh and Jesus made to those who obey him. Matthew 6, 28 through 33. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, neither do they spin. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today exists and tomorrow is thrown to the oven, won't he much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what do we wear, what do we drink, or with what do we be clothed? For the Gentiles seek after all those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. According to this, Christians don't have to think about food or clothes. They're actually commanded not to. Why? Yahweh will provide just as he provides for the lilies and the grass. But how does he provide for these plants? Does the grass get up every day and go out and work? Maybe uproot itself and move to a state where he can find better employment? No, the rains fall, the sun shines, and the earth provides. The grass doesn't toil, Jesus says. No work, no toil. And that means Christians shouldn't have to work or toil for their food. And yes, in a sense, this happens for Christians. They have the rain and sun and nuts and berries and herbs and animals for slaughter. But again, it rains on the just and the unjust, so the Gentiles and tax collectors, or those who refuse to obey Yahweh, receive the same blessings, just as he said. Yahweh even pretends that if we do his will by obeying his, our parents, he'll give us a longer life. Have you found that to be true? My mother was a Christian most of her life, and she died at the age of 63. I'm sure you could give examples like this, too. Yahweh provides absolutely nothing for Christians that others don't receive as well. If Christians want to eat and have clothes on their backs, they have to work just like their atheist friends and neighbors. It doesn't matter what they seek first. They have to seek all these things just as the Gentiles do. I know Christians like to talk, like to talk about how blessed they are. They find a car on sale and Yahweh blessed them. Never mind that their atheist neighbor found a better car <laughs> that was even cheaper. Yahweh specifically blessed the Christian, he declares. Any little good thing that happens, and Yahweh gets praise for it. Christians gobble up the crumbs that fall off Yahweh's table. He lies around on a cloud all day while they work themselves to death feeding him. Not with real food, of course, but with their constant praise for doing nothing. He gets fat and sassy, and they work their fingers to the bone. That's how they keep him alive. He's like Tinkerbell. We have to clap our hands and cry, I do believe in Yahweh, I do believe in Jesus. Otherwise, they both disappear. Christians don't even realize that their gods have broken their promises to them. In a covenant, there are agreements. There's some sort of quid pro quo, right? Something for something, favor for favor. You scratch my back and I scratch yours. One party does this and the other party does that. That's the nature of a covenant or contract. Christians are married to Jesus. Does that mean nothing? Is it a one-sided arrangement wherein the wife obeys without question and the husband ignores her all the live long day? He doesn't provide anything for her that he doesn't also give to all the other women and men living around his wife. Do you remember the song, Put a Little Bit on Me, written by Shel Silverstein and sang by Barbie Benton on her album Barbie Doll in 1974? It says, <clears throat> Put a little bit on me, sweet papa, put a little bit on me. You put a little bit on everybody else, everybody else you see. You put a little here, put a little there. All I want's my rightful share. Hey, Papa, don't you want to stop it? Put a little bit on me. So, so which is it, Christians? Do your gods put a little bit on everybody, or are you special and blessed? Now, you Christians should have an abundant life. That's what Jesus promised you. Christian, if you're reading this, do you see a difference in your life and that of your non-Christian neighbors? Are you healthier? Are you even happier? Are you among the 1% who own a... Uh, most of the money floating around? No? I know, I know, we all grow together, and at the end time of harvest, Jesus will gather the wheat into his barn and burn the chaff. But really? After not keeping the promises to you in this life? About making sure you're blessed above others? Anyway, what did he promise regarding the future? I mean, did he say, you serve me in this short little life, and I'll serve you in the next big long life? 
the forever life. No? No. He said, <laughs> you serve me in this short little life, and you keep on serving me in the next big long life. The forever life. Awesome, huh? Honestly, Jesus seems like a deadbeat to me. He seems like a person who wants to receive without giving. He wants a free lunch. He wants it before he even deserves it. Remember, technically, unless one accepts preterism, a Christian isn't really married to Jesus. The couple is only engaged at this point. Christians give it up before marriage in hopes that eventually the wedding will actually take place and they'll receive the promises Jesus made when he got engaged to him since they've been super good to him during the engagement period. They allow Jesus to enter them prematurely in hopes that he'll like it and he'll want to put a ring on it. Yahweh might have been married to Israel, but again, unless preterism is true, Jesus is not yet married to the church but only engaged. Christians produce fruit, but it's illegitimate. Jesus expects his fiance to behave like a wife toward him. Of course, despite the fact that he's not a husband to her. But let me tell you something. If a man doesn't woo you with gifts and kindnesses before the wedding, well, you can be sure he's not going to suddenly become romantic and loving after the marriage takes place. Besides, what incentive does Jesus have to marry Christians? They keep begging him to come back so the wedding can take place, but why would he want to? Remember that old saying, why buy a cow and get all the milk you want free? <laughs> Jesus is getting his. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. He hears it all the time. Why mess with a good thing? And please don't accuse me of being vulgar here. I didn't create the marriage analogy. Your God did. What kind of contract did you sign, Christians? Where are the benefits to you? Nothing in this life so far, right? Nothing any different from what a rank sinner receives. The promises of Jesus remain unfulfilled to this day. The only thing you get is that you won't get burnt as chaff. That's it. Jesus says, obey me now, so I'll know I can depend on you to keep doing it later. And I'll let you obey me forever ever, rather than burning you or annihilating you, if that's what you believe in. That's like my saying, bring me a pizza and a bottle of pop, or I'll hit you over the head with this hammer and knock you senseless. And you rush out, and you buy my pizza and pop, and hurry back with them, and offer them to me with a big smile on your face, hoping for a little praise, or thank you at the very least. And I say, well, keep it up till you die, and I'll make sure you get to cater to me forever. I don't consider this good, though. Nothing you do is really good. Nobody's good but me. All your righteousness is filthy rags in my eyes. So I'm amazing and wonderful even to condescend to allow you to praise me and do stuff for me. Why in the world would you expect somebody like me in that scenario to honor any promise made to you? And the thing is, that's not all I would say. If I wanted to be like Jesus, I'd also say, if you'll bring the pizza and pop, I'll make sure you eat well tonight. That's what Jesus promised, right? All these things. So you eagerly comply expecting a big steak dinner, but I give you nothing. You have to go out and make money and buy your own steak if you can afford it. Oh, but I won't let you work, and I condemn you if you're tall. Remember? That's what the Gentiles do, yuck. And you spent so much time concentrating on pleasing me that you didn't even get a good education so you could work and make good money. Especially if you're a woman in Fundyland. I know that's not true of some, but it is of too many. And not that everybody needs or wants higher education, but if the reason a woman doesn't pursue education is that she feels it's not what Jesus wants since he prefers women to stay at home and be obedient to their husbands, expecting their husbands to provide despite the fact that their spiritual husband, Jesus, doesn't, and men are not allowed to work or toil either, then that's pretty sad. A woman depends on the promises made to her. If a man, if a human man, said to a woman, marry me and I'll make sure you want for nothing, You'll have clothes and food, and you won't even have to think about it. And certainly you won't have to work or toil. And the woman trusts his word, yet he does nothing to feed or clothe her, that he doesn't also do for all the other women? Then that man is a liar and a deceiver. He is a breaker of covenants. Listen, Christians, you're not even getting scraps. Your God does absolutely nothing for you. Not even your prayers bring good to you from him, because he listens 
only if it's what he planned to do in the first place. You have no effect on him. I know you don't understand how the rest of us survive troublesome times without a God to lean on. Well, what's the difference between no God and a do-nothing God like you have? A God or a husband who never keeps his promises is worse than no God or no husband at all. Christians, Yahweh has not fulfilled his promises to you. He has broken covenant or is dead. Either way, Yahweh has left the building or was never in the building. And y'all are on your own just like the rest of us. You know, Ecclesiastes 9.11 states that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. I know Christians like to say they're blessed, not lucky, but that's not what the book says here, is it? And I truly wish you all all the luck in the world, Christians. May time and chance be ever on your side. But I got news for you. Unfortunately, according to the lovely story of Job, you not only aren't blessed by the rest of us, but sometimes you're actually picked on for special ill treatment by your God. Your best hope is to be lukewarm. According to the Bible, being either overly righteous or too wicked will bring will both bring about your destruction. My wish for you is that you're able to hide under Yahweh's radar. Take the rain and sun and quietly mind your own business and hope to the high heavens that Yahweh doesn't notice you. He's got nothing good to offer you that you can't get for yourself. And if you do get anything, you're for sure going to have to get it yourself. Yahweh and his son, your husband, have abandoned you. And you haven't even noticed, have you? That's because they never did anything for you in the first place. You know this because you look around and see it. Shoot, you even sing about it, don't you? Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder. Why, it should be this all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Why, why would you sing that? If Yahweh and Jesus were being honest when they made their big promises to you, you should be at peace even with your enemies, and nobody should be molesting you. Everything in your life should be hunky-dory, hunky-dory, but it's not, is it? Your gods are liars. Everything that happens is supposed to work together for your good. Your wife dies, yay, good for you. <laughs> not for her, maybe, but if she was a Christian, then for her, too. She was graduated to glory. And did you know that Yahweh makes children with mental issues in order to teach you a lesson and help you grow? Yes, surely some other Christian has made you aware of that piece of good news. Oh, but you can't have an abortion now. That doesn't work together for good to anybody. That's just evil with no good outcome. Now the babies, Yahweh told his precious ones to slaughter in the Old Testament. That's good. Those babies went straight to heaven. Apparently fetuses don't go to heaven, who knew? But back to you. Be honest. Has your life been the way Yahweh and Jesus promised it would be? And I mean not the contradictory and horrible stuff, but all the good stuff they promised. There's a reason y'all say, Jesus never promised the Christian life would be easy, but he said it would be worth it. Oh, but he did promise it would be easy, didn't he? Of course he did. After all, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's all a free gift, right? Christians, don't you see that you have never received anything at all from your gods. And sadly, you never will. This so-called relationship you have is one-sided. You give everything, your gods give diddly squat. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. You have a relationship with your imaginary friend, and it's worthless to you. Please don't fall for the Bible's lies. Please. Thank you all. Bye.